how these tests work, what they look for, what it is the doctors find or consider to be important. So I thought I would um, take you through two of the most commonly used ones for people with heart disease. And uh, hopefully you will live uh, with some of the excitement that I have about this kind of techniques, but also an improved understanding um, of how uh, they work and what it is doctors are looking at when they mm and ah as they look at these gray and black and white pictures. So these are my disclosures. And this is a brief outline of my talk. It's divided into three sections a brief introduction into cardiovascular imaging. I'll speak a little bit about ultrasound of the heart, what we call echocardiography. And then I will speak about MRI imaging of the heart, what we refer to as cardiovascular magnetic resonance. So this is what we do as doctors. We see a patient. It's critical in the diagnostic pathway that we are able to put them into a specific box. And if you ever sit with doctors, they will tell you that the biggest cause of headaches are the complex patients that we cannot put into a specific box. Because by putting them into a specific box, that is what allows us to be able to make a specific diagnosis. And once we've made the diagnosis or a label, then we are able to institute our management plan and treatment appropriately so that we can ensure the continued health of our patients. So in cardiology, these boxes are made up of a number of approaches. Probably the most important one being our ability to talk with the patient, to touch the patient and to examine them, and from that to be able to arrive at a diagnosis. And this is probably the most important box that we use. And over 90% of patients, we can reliably make a diagnosis using these seemingly primordial but very important uh, tools. And at the end of this exercise, if we don't have a clear diagnosis, we certainly have a list of suspicions or what we call differential diagnosis. And we can use additional tests to be able to narrow the most likely causes of the condition and therefore to be able to focus our management. And what I'm going to focus on are the techniques that we use for non-invasive cardiovascular imaging. But there are a number of other tests that are available in the diagnostic armamentarium of cardiologists. And these non-invasive cardiovascular tests include probably most commonly the chest X-ray, which I'm sure most of you have had, continuous X-rays, or what we call cine fluoroscopy, ultrasound imaging of the heart, which I'll talk a little bit in detail about, or what we call echocardiography. Increasingly, we use a lot of uh, computed tomography. A tomograph is a series of images uh, used to construct a two-dimensional image of uh, any part of the body. And these are typically cut in any orthogonal plane one desires. And we use um, CT or computer tomography both to look at anatomy, flow, uh, congenital defects, but probably most reliably these days to study non-invasively stenosis or narrowing of the coronary blood vessels that bring oxygen and nutrients to the muscle of the heart. And a tool very close to my own heart is cardiovascular magnetic resonance, which in my view is probably one of the most significant advances in medical technology, which is a technique which is uh, non-invasive, does not use ionizing radiation, and uses your own body's intrinsic magnetic properties to generate powerful information about the structure and function of any part of the body, including the heart. 
I won't talk about the radionuclide techniques. And recently, there's been growing uh, realization that if you train in cardiology, 10, 15 years ago, it would have sufficed to have been a generalist. But most people in the field now specialize further into intervention, electrophysiology, or imaging. But even if you do imaging, the field has expanded so much that most people tend to specialize just in ultrasound or MRI or CT or other techniques. And the important thing is that we acquire these images not only because they look beautiful and give us a lot of joy, but because they give us important information about the patients. And that information equips us to be able to change the fates of our patients. And so it's about being patient-centered and not being technology-focused. So as cardiologists, we're very spoiled. We have a number of both invasive and non-invasive imaging techniques available at our disposal. And if you speak to people who specialize in imaging, many of them will tell you my technique is far better than the other techniques. But of course, one has to appreciate the complementarity of these tools in allowing us to be able to arrive at the correct diagnosis and therefore to be able to treat our patients appropriately. So it's about the appropriate test for the appropriate patient. So a few words on ultrasound of the heart which is really the basis by which bats are able, though they are blind, to hunt for prey, even in the dark. And this is based on the travel of sound waves and them being reflected and going back to a source. So we use a box that is connected to a probe that we hold in our hand and we use high frequency ultrasounds emitted from that probe to interact both with static and moving structures within the body of the patient. And those structures then reflect the sound waves back to the probe, which is able to pick them up and to generate this information that tells us about the structure and function of the body. So ultrasounds, I'm often asked what they are and what the term ultrasound actually means. They are merely sound waves, and what makes them ultrasound waves is the fact that they have frequencies higher than the spectrum of audible human hearing, which is about 20,000 hertz. So in terms of their physical properties, they are no different from any of the sound waves that we are used to. And typically, the ones that we use for imaging range from between 1 gigahertz to about 6 gigahertz. And of course, they are used for many things. Probably most of them are most familiar with sound waves when they are used in pregnant women to tell us both about the health of a developing baby as well as the estimated fetal age. But they can be used to assess for deficits in structure of uh, solid objects. We can use them to assess for flaws in structures in areas where visibility is limited or does not exist. And the scale varies from using ultrasounds to study very small insects to looking at the structure of the floor of oceans. We can use them industrially at very high fields to um, clean objects, to accelerate chemical processes. And of course, as I started off, many animals, like snakes in the dark, are able to climb up trees without seeing, and that's because um, they are able to use uh, ultrasounds to be able to detect both prey and uh, obstacles. <laughs> 
and increasingly they are also being used as a way of uh, complex communication amongst humans. So I'll tell you a little bit about the machines that we use. So a typical ultrasound machine has got five basic components. A pulse generator, which is what generates the sounds, usually from electrical energy, which is uh, converted into kinetic energy and then sound energy. And a transducer, which we hold in the hand and it's got what are known as piezoelectric um, crystals, which vibrate at specific frequencies and release the sound waves, which then enter the body through what we call specific acoustic windows. And those are then reflected back to the same um, handheld probe, which transmits them um, as receive images now and uh, through very complex mathematical algorithms is able to use the differences in energy between the transmitted and received signals to generate an ultrasound image. And of course, we are able to store these images and can play them as videos for diagnostic purposes, as I'll show you later in this talk. So in order to understand uh, a little bit about ultrasound, one has to understand a little bit about the hemodynamics of the body, and in particular, those of blood flow. So blood is a fluid, but it's a very complex fluid. It's made up of water, which is both within cells as well as um, free, the water has a lot of chemicals within it, many of which are proteins, but also contains a lot of ions, which are important for many of the reactions which keep us alive. In terms of the cellular properties, the most abundant ones will be your red blood cells, which contain hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen, and that is what um, allows us uh, to be alive. And there are also white blood cells who have a large family and they perform a number of immunological functions, pr precisely protecting us from different kinds of infections and allowing our bodies to be able to mount appropriate uh, responses against uh, invading uh, organisms, as well as platelets, which primarily allow our blood to be able to form clots. So it's by no means a uniform fluid. And blood flows in these tubes within our bodies that we call arteries and veins, which are very plastic. And of course, the innermost lining, the endothelium, is alive and contracts in a pulsatile fashion, okay? And so there's elasticity there. And this is very important for a number of reasons, which I may touch on later. Now, the properties of blood can be defined in several ways. We often talk about the density, which is the mass of an object per unit volume. And if you compare blood to water, blood has a slightly higher density to water. So if you pour blood in water, it will sink to the bottom because of the differential di density between the two fluids. We also speak about resistance, which is the response to acceleration um, and uh, often is an expression of friction. And the greater the density of the fluid, the greater the resistance to flow. And viscosity is another property of blood. And this really refers uh, primarily to the thickness of the fluid and therefore the greater resistance to flow. So what determines flow rates both within the heart as well as within our own blood vessels? Well, if you think of a blood vessel as a cube, and in that cube, you have a diameter which varies in areas of uh, stenosis or narrowing. You will have a very high pressure gradient before the narrowing and after the narrowing. 
And in areas of very little narrowing, there's hardly a gradient. So that gradient is an important determinant at how quickly blood or any fluid is able to flow within these cubes. Importantly, resistance is another property which determines how fast fluids can flow. The greater the resistance, the slower the rates of flow. And resistance will, of course, be related in a complex mathematical fashion to both the thickness or viscosity of blood, the radius of the lumen, or how narrow the uh, lumen is, as well as the length of the vessel where the flow is occurring. So there are different kinds of flow that we see within the body. And I'm going to talk about the two uh, primary ones that we see most commonly. So when blood flows within these cubes that are our blood vessels, it doesn't flow as a single uniform fluid, but it actually flows in layers. And we refer to that as laminar flows. And these layers are composed of different uh, types of uh, bloods and the typology is determined by the rates of flow with the highest velocities occurring in the center of the cube and the slowest rates because of the higher friction closer to the edge um, being uh, slow um, there. And then sometimes when there is a change, a sudden change, either in the shape, the angulation, or the size of these cubes, you get a disturbance in the pattern of flow, and flow becomes chaotic, typically vertical. And these vortices have blood flowing the fastest on the outside and the slowest in the middle. And they're actually very dangerous things to have or care within our bodies. So for instance, in people who have um, a big left atrium as a consequence of long-standing hypertension, the pattern of blood flow may change, and this increases one to propensity to form clots because of the differential rates of flow in these vertical um, structures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the hemodynamics of uh, echo, and then we'll look at some images, and hopefully you will see why this uh, seemingly scientific background is actually relevant to understanding the images that we look at. So Johann Christian Doppler, who was an Austrian mathematician, was the first person to describe what is eponymously now known as the Doppler phenomenon. And he wrote a seminal book entitled um, On the Colored Light of Double Stars and Some Other Heavenly Body. And uh, the title is rather misleading um, because uh, it focuses on light and uh, astronomy. But in there, he also describes this very important principle in medicine, which is that the frequency of reflected uh, waves is altered by a moving subject. And the prototypical example is you standing in one place and hearing the sirens of an ambulance, which comes from a distance. And you can hear the noise getting louder and louder as it approaches you, and again becoming less loud as it travels away from you. And that really is what, in the most simplest term, the Doppler principle describes. So the wavelength of sound, put differently, is proportional to the velocity or speed of the moving object, as well as the direction of motion of the object. And we know that uh, the emitting frequency is specific in our probe. We are able to measure the frequency reflected back to our probe and the change in frequency between what is constant in the probe and what is being reflected back is called the Doppler shift. And this is really 
the functional premise of ultrasound. So there are different kinds of spectral Doppler waves that we can see. We refer to pulse wave, which is the measurement of a specific frequency in a specific area of uh, a column of flowing blood, as opposed to continuous wave Doppler, where you measure the velocity or frequency in that entire column rather than focusing on a specific point. And then to make sense to us, we also use color flow Doppler, where the blood or fluid moving towards our probe appears red, and the fluid or blood moving away from the probe appears to be blue. And so we can get these images where these colors tell us both about the hemodynamics of the valves, is there stenosis, is there leakage, or what we call incompetence or regurgitation, and can we measure the pressure gradient across a specific structure, but also the direction in which blood is flowing. So this is um, a typical appearance uh, on ultrasound. Let's see if my videos will play without stopping. So in this one, they seem to have a mind of their own. Um, let me do something quickly, because this is important. So if we go to playback. Mm. OK. Sorry about that. So in this image, oh, <laughs> it's got a mind of its own. Um, we can uh, appreciate different structures uh, of the heart. We can see the different valves opening and closing. We are able to look at the direction of flow of blood. We can measure the chamber sizes, the ventricles, which are the main contractile chambers of the heart, as well as the atria, which are the storage chambers of the heart. We are also able to measure function of the heart, in other words, the contractile property of the muscle of the heart or carrying in different directions. Importantly, we can also measure the relaxation of the heart, um, what we refer to as diastology. And the stiffer the heart or the more reduced the compliance is, um, the, the less the function uh, tends to be. So one might ask, with ultrasound imaging of the heart, what are the advantages? Well, it's portable. You can carry it anywhere with you. It's easily accessible. Almost anywhere you go, it's easy to find. Um, and most people are relatively familiar with it. It's easy to do. It's relatively cheap. It's safe. Good, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's relatively safe with no known harmful effects. Sometimes with the older machines, if you imaged for a long time, that would cause local heating. But the newer machines, as of about five years ago, have got uh, thermal indicators. And once the probe reaches a certain temperature, the scanner stops working for a few minutes to cool down. And importantly, for these reasons, ultrasound can be repeated as frequently as possible. And it's important not only for making the diagnosis to allow us to be able to 
treat you appropriately, but once we've treated somebody, we can then repeat the imaging to assess the efficacy of our therapeutic interventions and to monitor patients with chronic diseases. Of course, there are a number of uh, um, drawbacks to any of the tests that we use. It tends to be operator dependent, so it's very much reliant on the skill of the ultrasonographer. There are limited uh, acoustic windows or areas through which you can image in the body. And it can be affected uh, by the habitus of the patient. So in a patient who is uh, very overweight, the imaging might be difficult. In somebody with um, hyperinflation of the lungs, for instance, patients with emphysema, the distance from the chest wall to the heart um, is further, and so the imaging tends to be compromised. And then in people with chest wall deformities or other congenital abnormalities, it can be a bit difficult. And of course, very sick patients where having detailed information about the function of the heart is important, may be limited in the ICU setting where they are incubated and on ventilators. And of course, patients who are receiving certain drugs, the medication that we use changes the hemodynamic properties of the body, and particularly those undergoing anesthesia, the reliability of the data with ultrasound is often questionable. So the techniques that we use, you'll hear doctors and a lot of lay people talking about B mode, M mode. So M mode is really what tells us about the structure and function of the heart. And these are the typical parameters that we are able to measure with B mode. So chamber size, chamber function. And then we can look at the valves and how they are working. We can also use it uh, to measure the hemodynamics using uh, the Doppler technique. And so we can look at both narrow wings and leakages. We can look at turbulence of flow. And we can look at stiffness of the muscle of the heart. So that's ultrasound and its basics and essentially how it works. So I'm going to change track and uh, talk a little bit about MRI. And then I'll stop there today and hopefully give us enough time for questions or discussion. And um, I'll be happy to take as many questions as you may have. So I started out the talk by saying that I thought MRI is probably the most significant advance in medical technology. And it has a rich history which goes back to the 1800s. And a Hungarian fellow by the name of Nikola Tesla, who was a polymath, he was a poet, he was an author, he was an engineer, and he built bridges. Uh, but he also um, made a very important observation, which is that magnetic fields are not only static, which had been the prevailing belief for centuries, but was that they can, under specific conditions, also be rotating. And in fact, most of the time, uh, magnetic fields that we observe have what we call a dipole moment. In other words, they have constant rotation or precession about an axis. And uh, because of his uh, seminal contribution to the birth of this field of magnetic resonance or MRI imaging, the image unit of MRI was then changed from a Gauss to a Tesla. And a Tesla is equal to 10,000 Gauss. And um, I'll come back to talk a little bit about Teslas. Now, I jump about 50 years later away from Hungary to Columbia University in uh, New York City, where in a physics lab over a 20-year period, uh, 
they were able to produce about 30 Nobel laureates. And uh, it was arguably the golden age uh, of physics. And a young student by the name of Isidore Isaac Rabbi, who was working on a project completely unrelated uh, to what would be his most seminal contribution, asked himself the question after hours, what would happen if you take a static object and you expose it to ever increasing magnetic field strengths? And so there are these superconducting uh, magnets uh, available. And of course, the birth of the field of magnetic resonance, in particular nuclear magnetic resonance, where the subcellular structures, the elements of an atom, which is the most basic component um, of our composition, those elements are able to jump up and down energy levels when exposed to these very powerful magnetic fields. And that's really the basis of MRI. And then I jump again another 50 years later. This very important observation laid dormant in dusty scientific journals until uh, Paul Lutterberg, uh, working um, in Boston, was able to uh, demonstrate the first nuclear magnetic resonance image. And then a few years later, uh, Raymond uh, Damadian, uh, working in Stony Brook in New York, produced the very first um, MRI image of the body where he was able to show that patients with brain tumors, and of course the brain was the very first image that was uh, taken of the body because the brain is by far the easiest part of the body to image if somebody is able to lie still, and showed that tumors uh, have a different image signal to brains of healthy people. And this was a very important step because it led us to understand that we can use MRI contrast to tell us about states of disease and health in different body parts. And of course, uh, Peter Mansfield started uh, working uh, in the UK to apply this to study different parts of the body. So how does MRI work? Well, I've sort of alluded to it. Um, you can choose any atom you are interested in. And in the body, hydrogen uh, is the most abundant atom because it binds with oxygen to form water, which constitutes about 70% of our bodies. And I've mentioned that unpaired protons which is the positive charge in the nucleus of an atom, these can act both as static objects, but they can also act as magnets in that they possess spin. They have a dipole moment and constantly process about an axis. And if you expose them to a high enough magnetic field, you can then excite them and cause them to jump energy states from lower energy states to higher energy states. And so we have a magnet which is constantly turned on. And this magnet has got what we call equilibrium magnetization. We then introduce a radio frequency pulse which excites the hydrogen protons um, within our bodies. And they jump different energy levels. And we switch off that radio frequency excitation. And as they return back to their original resting position, they give off energy. 
and there are different ways in which they can give off that energy. One can be energy given off to the surrounding environment. In other words, what we call spin lattice relaxation or T1 time. Or the other common way is that you have precession about an axis in one specific direction. And as they relax back to their original energy state, they then process in the opposite direction. And so spins in opposing directions will then cancel each other out. And therefore, the energy is depleted, and they return back to their resting energy state. And then we have coils that uh, have gradients that allow us to be able to produce these radio frequency pulses in the x, y, and z directions so that we can image now three-dimensionally the body in any orthogonal plane that we so desire. And then we have an RF detector, which is able to detect the energy given off by the spins that were excited. And using a very uh, fancy mathematical origin that we call Fourier transformation, which has to do with the relationship between velocity, frequency, and the wavelength, we can then convert the differences in energy into the images that you and I see. And all of that happens in this mythical area called K-space. And um, now you might ask, what is so special about the heart? Well, it's special for a number of reasons, uh, many of which are philosophical, but also because um, it is probably the hardest part of the body to image because the heart, by necessity, has to be in constant motion. It has to contract in order to keep us alive. And I know that uh, a famous surgeon by the name of Christian Barnett said, a heart is but a bump. Um, of course, uh, <laughs> a bump, yes. But uh, the heart is actually very complex, so the Muscle layers of the heart are arranged in three layers, longitudinal fibers, radial fibers, as well as those that are circumferential. And the right side of the heart gains most of its contractile properties from the longitudinal fibers, whereas the left ventricle of the heart, which is the main chamber, gains most of its uh, contractile property from these circumferential fibers, which result in this constant ringing and unringing motion of the heart. So in three dimensions, during any cardiac cycle, it's constantly making these very complex movements. And as though that complex movement wasn't bad enough to contend with, we also by necessity need to breathe and the movement of our lungs, breathing, means that uh, you have another dimension of movement to deal with when you have uh, to image uh, these hearts. So we normally use electrocardiographic vector gating, which is a fancy way of saying that you put electrodes onto the chest and have a constant ECG or electrical signal monitoring of the heart. And even though the images that you see look like a movie or a scene, they actually are acquired mostly during a short window of the heart and interleaved acquisition in other parts of the cardiac cycle where the heart is moving a lot. And so the images are actually a series of stills. And these stills, we play them close to each other 
much like the old cartoons where you flip the paper and it looks like a movie. And that's what you see both with ultrasound and in particular with MRI. And there is a concept of temporal resolution. In other words, how quickly you are able to flip from one still to the next that determines both the resolution and the image quality, as well as the quality of the image we are able to capture about that part of the body that we are interested in. So most of the imaging that we do with MRI is at 1.5 Tesla to 7 Tesla, of course, named after Nikola Tesla. And to give you perspective, the Earth's magnetic field is 50 micro Tesla. Micro is 1 over 10 to the minus 6. So compared to these magnets that we use, um, the Earth's very powerful magnetic field is actually minuscule in relation. So 1.5 Tesla is just a little over 30,000 times more powerful than the magnetic field of the Earth. So powerful magnets. And they are superconducting, and that's because uh, we are able to enhance their magnetic properties by keeping them at very low temperatures using liquid helium. And it's important to be cognizant that they're always on whether we are imaging or not. And horrible accidents have occurred where lay people rush into the scanner rooms without being adequately prepared. And the magnetic field in the bore of the magnet is always aligned in this head to foot direction. And this is what creates equilibrium magnetization, or what we refer to as B naught. So I've told you a little bit about um, the acquisition of the heart in three dimensions and how using electrocardiographic vector gating allows us to be able to capture most of diastasis, which is when the heart is relatively still, and very few acquisitions in systole, which is when the heart is contracting. And then we are able to acquire either prospectively, in other words, during a few bits of the cardiac cycle, or we can just acquire throughout and then filter the noise and look backwards at what we are most interested in, or what we call retrospective acquisition. Now, in order to be able to deal with the effect of respiration, most people having an MRI scan of their heart would be asked to hold their breath. But of course, this is limited by how long you can hold your breath for. And a typical scan is usually in the vicinity of two to 10 seconds. A few sequences that we use may go for up to 20 seconds. But of course, you can imagine somebody who is unwell may struggle to hold their breath for long. And it is the movement which is our enemy in imaging because it impairs image quality. So there are techniques that we use either rather than imaging the whole structure that we are interested in, we can image a few key points uh, and using interleaved imaging, shorten the scan time because we don't need as much data. Or you can use what are called parallel acquisition techniques where you can image different parts of the organ at the same time and then retrospectively add the data together to give you what you're interested in. So I thought I would uh, just touch on the concept of uh, magnetism, because it is so central uh, to our techniques in MRI. And this is something that we use every day uh, in uh, 
daily speak, magnetism, somebody's attractive, maybe you have a certain affinity, you like something about them. And of course, scientifically, it means the same thing. Um, and uh, it really refers to the property of matter, uh, which occurs as a consequence primarily of electrons orbiting around atoms, but importantly within the atoms themselves, the different components, the protons, the neutrons, all possess the same quality of being in constant orbit. And uh, all of us are actually magnets because we are made up of these atoms. And I know that we are often attracted to each other, but you might ask, why is it that we're not constantly uh, bumping into each other? And that's because uh, our atoms within our bodies are not organized. They spin in different directions, and so they cancel each other out. So we are actually ineffective magnets. But when put, for instance, in an MRI field, we actually become very powerful magnets because all of the atoms in our body in these superconducting fields actually become magnets themselves. Okay. So the magnetic field, as I've mentioned, is measured either in Gauss historically or more recently we use uh, the metric measurement, which is the Tesla. And um, there are concepts that are important. You will hear people often speaking of ferromagnetism. And um, these are particles or objects that have very high magnetic susceptibility. In other words, when they're exposed to a magnetic field, they are highly attractive to it. So for instance, um, metals like iron and nickel, if you expose them to a magnetic field, they will be quickly uh, glued uh, to the magnet. And then you have uh, other materials that may be paramagnetic, uh, for instance, oxygen or gadolinium, which I'll talk about, um, where they have unpaired electrons resulting in positive susceptibility, uh, but this is less powerful than that of um, uh, ferromagnetic objects. And it's important um, to consider safety because um, many of the scanner is constantly on, and many objects that we use medically are actually ferromagnetic. And so we have to be careful that uh, when we go next to the scanners, most uh, tools that we use medically have to be adapted and uh, either be made of plastic or made with uh, metallic elements that are not magnetic so that they are safe for our patients. And when patients go in there, we have to make sure that the bras they wear don't have metal wires. Their watches will stop working when exposed to the magnetic field that is strong, because the watch also works on the premise of magnetism. Um, electric, for instance, uh, if you have um, most jewelry, uh, if it's not gold, um, will uh, act as a ferromagnetic particle that will accelerate as you approach the scanner. And credit cards, the data on all of our cards is actually written in magnetic strips. And so when you expose them to these powerful magnets, they actually wipe the data off. Okay. So I thought I would just um, also explain the concept of resonance, which I think we've already spoken about, which is really the spin about a constant axis, or what we call precession. And the spin of biological elements occurs at fixed frequencies. And there is a relationship of the frequency to the strength of the magnetic field. And this relationship 
is um, uh, explained by what we call the Lamour frequency, which states that um, the frequency of an object um, processing uh, is determined by the gyromagnetic ratio multiplied by the magnetic field strength. And so we are able to use this powerful technique to be able to give us powerful information and multiple parameters about the cardiovascular system. We can measure and can glean information about anatomy of the heart and vasculature. We can measure function, both global function of chamber contractility, but we can also look at segmental or regional function, where we can look at a specific uh, segment of the heart. We can even narrow it further down using strain imaging, where we are able to look at a speckle of myocardium of the heart and be able to measure very specific uh, information about displacement, strain, strain rates, twist and torsion, and how each pixel uh, that we image moves in three dimensions. We can look at tissue characteristics. In other words, we can measure the inflammatory burden of the myocardium. We can measure the amount of edema or water that is contained in sick tissues. And this is one of the most powerful features of this kind of imaging, where no other technique will allow you to glean those insights in the diagnostic process. We can measure tissue infiltration. So for instance, with sarcoidosis or ion overload. We can uh, look at perfusion of the myocardium, both at rest and at stress, and therefore be able to measure under conditions of stress, how well our hearts are able to deal with reduced oxygen demand. We can measure viability, for instance, following a heart attack, see how much of the myocardium is scarred and how much is still alive. We can look at the blood vessels in any part of the body. We can look at scarring or fibrosis. We can look at four-dimensional flow. This is a fancy way of saying three-dimensional flow and include the dimension of time. We can measure myocardial energetics, in other words, the metabolic content of the myocardium, where we can measure certain uh, elements like phosphor, creatine, ATP, um, and uh, glean how well the muscle of the heart is able to use the energy substrates available at its disposal to be able to do its work. We can also measure the amount of fat or lipids both inside the cells of the heart as well as uh, in other tissues um, outside uh, of the heart, or what we call lipidosis. So you may ask, what are the advantages of this uh, imaging technique that I love so much? Well, it has both very high spatial resolution. In other words, it allows us to be able to narrow in on a very small part of the heart and we can get images with very high detail or resolution, but at the same time has got very high temporal resolution. So you can measure in time um, and be able to miss very little gaps in these uh, still images of the heart that make up your scenes. Because uh, the imaging is three-dimensional, it's the most accurate form of imaging available to us. It's very robust and reproducible. And unlike ultrasound, the inter-observer variability is very low. So it's not dependent on the user. And importantly, it's safe. 
unlike most imaging modalities like CT, X-rays, fluoroscopy, or nuclear techniques that are premised on using ionizing radiation, it doesn't involve any radiation and really is premised on your own body's intrinsic magnetic properties and the results are very consistent. And it's the only technique, as I mentioned, that gives you information about the amount of scarring or fibrosis, the amount of inflammation, the amount of water content or edema in the tissues. Of course, it has its drawbacks. It's expensive. Uh, very few people know how to do it. And uh, in some patients, particularly those who've had metallic implants, uh, it may be contraindicated. And some people, probably about 2 to 5% of people, have claustrophobia and uh, struggle lying still in the space. And so we cannot perform the test. And so the common indications would include heart failure, patients with uh, inflammation of the heart, patients who've had heart attacks, patients with um, infiltration of the heart, uh, it gives us a lot of information in patients with congenital heart disease, and um, we can use it uh, for a number of uh, important indications where no other test is able to give us um, equivalent information. So I've spoken about the coils, and I'm just going to touch uh, lastly on the concept uh, of safety. Because uh, we use these very powerful magnets uh, to image uh, with MRI, uh, ferromagnetic and to a lesser extent paramagnetic objects can then act as projectiles when they interact with a magnetic field, which can be very dangerous. These uh, magnetic fields, which are very powerful, can also induce electric field currents, which may result in burns when we make loops with different body parts. And of course, uh, they can cause electric shocks, but this is much less common with newer generations of uh, MRI scanners. And these are important considerations. This is, uh, as you can see, a standard uh, bed from the ward, which contains a lot of ferromagnetic particles patients uh, who've been bent. And people often forget that um, the content of uh, the dye in tattoos had to be changed around the 1980s when a large volume of people, particularly in the US, started uh, undergoing this form of imaging because the old dye contained a lot of ion particles and the MRI would excite these ion particles and cause local bends. And so the newer generations uh, of dye um, in tattoos uh, are relatively safe. But many of our patients had their tattoos done when they were teenagers, and we often uh, are faced with this problem. So what about contrast? What allows us to be able to gain information about scarring, about infiltration. Well, we use elements. I'm sure many of you will remember this from your days in school, yeah. the periodic table. And so my favorite element is number 64. Where is it? Yeah, gadolinium. So it's at the bottom of the uh, periodic table. And that's for a good reason, because this bottom table it's got a fancy name that I won't go into, but basically contains a group of relatively inert elements. In other words, they do not participate in chemical reactions. And so gadolinium is relatively safe. We inject it intravenously, and it circulates in the body and goes through all your organs and allows us to be able to image uh, any part of the body that we're interested in. And within an hour, 90% of it will be in your bladder because your kidneys get rid of it. 
But in patients with uh, kidney disease, their ability to be able to excrete the gadolinium is impaired. And um, in the past, there was an association between kidney disease and the use of gadolinium resulting in a new medical condition known as nephrogenic sclerosing uh, fibrosis, or NSF. And um, this has now virtually disappeared.